Hello, everybody, and, and welcome today um, to our May Humanity and Healthcare series. I'm going to jump in and get started. I think everyone should be entered from their waiting room. And I just want to remind everybody that we are being video recorded, um, just to let everyone know ahead of time as we get started. So I want to start with an acknowledgement of the lands that Queens is situated on. And I'm here today in Kingston on the traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory and grateful for the parks and trails, which I've spent the last month walking on in the past. And also as I look out the window, looking at the, the tulips and the daffodils popping out. And I also want to acknowledge the planning committee here today. So you've seen um, Damon Dagnoni, Ernest Nelgo clark Hugh Wiley, Mike McDonald and Shana Watson. And we represent um, community partners, multiple disciplines and across the healthcare sector as well. And also just wanted to officially let everyone know that we have no specific disclosures or conflicts of interest for this session. And so this here today is a PowerPoint free zone conversation. I'm thrilled to say other than my PowerPoint slides, um, which you'll be stopping seeing in a very short second. And just to let everyone know, this is very much a conversation tonight. And so as soon as I stop sharing, I'm going to hand the floor over to Terry. And just to let everyone know that you're more than welcome to put lots of comments or discussion points in the chat. And Terry will be talking for 15 minutes. We'll stop and have a conversation. And then Terry will, will start again. And then we'll end on a conversation. So again, very much um, here, here together. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so I can introduce Terry here. So I am thrilled to be able to, to introduce Terry Landry today as our May speaker. So I've had the privilege of knowing Terry for, oh, over a decade now. It's, I was thinking back to when we first met. I've known Terry as an occupational therapist um, when he was working on the assertive community treatment team, as a manager of the high intensity treatment team, and now as regional director of the community adult mental health services at Providence Care. And as you'll see today, and I might get a little teary talk introducing Terry already, he has dedicated his career to supporting individuals with persistent and severe mental health and truly works to make sure that each individual person is seen as a unique human being. He has been so involved in regional mental health services, um, really helping to reshape the mental health strategy here and now the Ontario Health Team and really truly working to ensure that people have access to community mental health and making sure it's, it's accessible. And many of you who really know Terry realize that he also is not only a phenomenal occupational therapist and advocate, but an, an amazing hockey and soccer coach as well. And I, my daughters had the privilege of being coached by him across many, many teams and many years. So I'm um, thrilled that Terry's here and, and gonna hand the floor over to you, Terry. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I, I cannot thank you enough. I realize that it is a privilege to be uh, here in this in this position today. So, for everyone else's benefit, uh, when Catherine and I were were chatting about what we were going to talk about, because we weren't really sure uh, when we what would the topic be around humanity and healthcare from a mental health perspective, we thought it would be best, first of all, to have no powerpoints uh, for me to share with anyone because you're probably tired of looking at that today and this week and this year, uh, that we'll have a conversation and the conversation will be about uh, recovery, a recovery model in uh, when we're, how do we provide service uh, for the people we serve? Um, how do we view our clients who we're serving? What lens are we looking through? How do we view ourselves um, in, this, in this equation? So I'll start by talking a little bit, and a lot of you on the screen will have already heard me say this, uh, this next bit, but uh, we'll do it again anyways, just for fun. So I'm just gonna ask you to indulge me by using your imagination, uh, since I'm not gonna call up any graphics, and picture in your brain, in your mind, uh, a line, like a number line, a horizontal line going across like this. And picture that that is some kind of a spectrum. I want you to really use your imagination and down on this end of the spectrum, I want you to picture this person in your, in your head. Picture what this person would look like. It's, it's a human being who has, who has no mental health symptoms at all, no psychosis, no, no depression, never has had experience uh, with a low mood or depressed mood or suicidal thoughts or any anxiety, no, no sleepless nights, uh, no excessive worry about having to present to a group of providers at a webinar, 
never had that kind of anxiety. Um, they uh, have never used substances in order to cope with any of things because, of course, they don't have any uh, symptoms that they need to cope with or deal with. Um, they don't use illicit drugs or alcohol or caffeine or nicotine or any of those things. Um, they, they have a winning personality. They have no difficulty controlling their emotions. Uh, they're able to, to satiate themselves quite easily. Um, no powerful emotions going on. And they have really high social skills. And uh, this causes lots of people to be attractive, attracted to them and they want to be around them all the time. They have all kinds of roles in the community. Not only do they have a, a great career going on, but they hold all kinds of volunteer positions. And you, you see these people out and about all the time uh, in community areas. They are uh, impeccable with cleanliness and self-care. They have never had a bad hair day and they've never uh, not had uh, clothing to get to work on a Monday morning. Their suit and their clothing is always pressed and neatly laundered. They have complete access to everything in their home that they need and all the physical abilities that they they need to do to access all of the self-care activities that they do. They have a, uh, a brilliant education uh, and they couldn't ask for more. And they enjoy a really active leisure life, both passive and active. And it's, it's, uh, it's, their downtime is just wonderful, even during the pandemic. Uh, they have the perfect housing situation and uh, they, the mortgage is paid, of course. And they will never sell it. Despite the housing uh, market explosion right now, they're still not going to sell their home because they love their housing situation. And the partner that, who they're with is perfect. They're deeply in love and they've never had any conflict or tension. And they are accepted by everyone around them in the world. And uh, as you are picturing this person in your mind, of course, you're saying to yourself, this, there's no such thing as this person. This person doesn't exist. And that's exactly right. That person does not exist. And we all know it. Now let's, thinking about that line as we, as we take our gaze down to the other end of the spectrum, let's picture someone who in fact has all kinds of symptoms of a mental illness. Uh, there's some psychosis there, living with chronic depression and anxiety uh, all the time. And as a result, they use uh, all kinds of substances, crystal meth uh, to cold cocaine to help uh, feel lifted, uh, a chronic alcohol abuse, um, and it's not in remission and there's no harm reduction happening. This person is living in a state of lack, this person that you're imagining down here. Uh, they do not have housing. Uh, they've never been able to be housed because uh, of various uh, behaviors and problems uh, managing stressors and po problems coping with daily activities. So they end up getting evicted and then evicted from shelter and then uh, living in a state of homelessness constantly. And so they don't have any access to the community, uh, including uh, transportation and, and health care. Uh, they have very poor self-care uh, and uh, no ability to, to maintain their self-care independently and no leisure skills, no leisure activities uh, to speak of. Uh, they have zero education and uh, really no skill set uh, or no, no strength to speak of. And so now, of course, as you're thinking about if this person exists, they don't. Of course they don't exist. There's no person, no human in the world who... Uh, is completely lacking of uh, strength or skills or resources. Um, but often we're looking at someone in a snapshot in time and we can, we can snap to a quick judgment by allowing our mind to go there. In reality, if we're thinking about this spectrum up and down, we're all on it. Everyone on this call is on that spectrum somewhere. We're all endeavoring to to move the needle that way in our life. We all are in that, in that sense in some sort of recovery. Um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, many of us have found ourselves, a lot of the population have found ourselves creeping down this way. And we use coping mechanisms to, to slide ourselves back towards optimal mental health and quality of life. But we are all in this together. We are all, all having this human experience across this spectrum. Some of us have found coping skills and, and resources. So I tend, at, as an example, at the end of the day, like today, after being on Teams calls all day, wearing the mask off and on, I get a dry mouth and a scratchy throat. So a good coping mechanism is to have a sip of water. Another good coping mechanism could be maybe a sip of whiskey. That would probably clear my throat, but probably not the best coping mechanism in the middle of a presentation here at work. So we all use various coping mechanisms and we all slide up and down 
when we're down in this end of the, of the spectrum, often there's a, that's a snapshot in time. That may be an inpatient stay, it may be presentation to emerge, it may be obviously a very dark time in someone's life. Not the time to be judging or assessing based on that single point in time, it really is a snapshot. The truth is that everyone across this whole spectrum, including down here, has a full life story as a human being. And when we are making the assumption that this person's life is represented by what we see down here, that's a disservice. And that's where recovery comes in. So I wanted to chat a little bit about how that's how we see ourselves uh, along with our, the people who are serving. But what does that mean for recovery? If somebody is finding themselves down in this end, what do we do to help improve quality of life and move back down toward this end? And so in, in, I know a lot of people on this, on this uh, call will recognize that, that recovery is a difficult concept sometimes to, to, to understand. And uh, mental illness in general was misunderstood and recovery all too. So I'd like to conceptualize what does a recovery model mean in comparison to say a medical model. And in a medical model, we look at symptoms or groups of symptoms, and then we endeavor to obliterate the symptoms. So you have a group of symptoms that equals a diagnosis, and then we can attack those symptoms and treat the symptoms, and then that treats the diagnosis, and then we're on our way. But mental, mental health and mental illness and recovery doesn't work that way because we know that mental illness creeps into every little part of someone's life, into their relationships, into their career, into their daily activities, their quality of life. And we know, for example, if somebody's living with symptoms of a mental illness for some time and we, we, we magically find a medication like clozapine or something that's super effective and it just gets rid of all of the symptoms, that's not going to translate into a, a quality, quality of life for the people we're serving. So we take a recovery approach. And for me, um, to understand what recovery means, I find it easier to, to consider what it means in physical and medical rehab. So my background is actually in spinal cord and acquired brain injury rehabilitation. And if you think the way we approach uh, rehabilitation, let's say, um, from a physical medical perspective, we don't focus just on symptoms. We don't just focus on, okay, we must um, have this improve and this improve and this improve, and then everything will, will, will get better. There'll be an improved quality of life. If you know, TV has you believing anything and said you can just walk up and down the parallel bars over and over and over again, and then that's going to jump to the, to, the, to the next part of the movie or the television show. The truth is we look at what are our options? What are the strengths uh, what, that we can access? What are the resources that we can access? Can we modify a home so that people can be more autonomous? And what are we actually considering? Are we looking at autonomy or independence? And we can access... Uh, the community, we can access legislation and funding to make sure that the community is more accessible. Uh, we can, above all, hold on to the hope for the people we're serving, uh, despite having a serious uh, physical illness onset or injury. We hold the hope because we know sometimes uh, the people we serve are going to lose that hope, and it really is our responsibility to hold on to that hope for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we don't just focus on the symptoms, we focus on the strengths the resources, what we have at hand, and we focus on goals that we can reach, and the goals have to be directed by the people we're serving. So the person we're serving has agency, is not a passive participant along in this, in this journey. So, so it is too for in mental health rehabilitation. Uh, everything I just said about rehabilitation for PhysMed goes for mental health as well. Taking a recovery approach, we focus on the symptoms a little bit, we want to treat symptoms. We want to ensure medication is optimized and symptoms are managed. Um, but we have to recognize that the, the people we're serving are very complex human beings. And there's, there's no way, and, and mental illness is complex. And there's no way that uh, a simple solution like medication only is going to result in improved quality of life. So we take the same, we take the same approach of looking at the strengths and the resources. Uh, what can we access? What are the client's goals and how can we reach them? And despite maybe in our mind picturing somebody from this skewed view down at this end, there are strengths and resources that we can, we can build on. So that, for example, uh, after somebody has a, an accident that results in a physical injury, if they would like to go back to being the CEO of the Bank of Montreal, then that's a goal we work on. Whatever goals we're 
there's, we don't lower the bar because of because of disability. The bar is where the bar ought to be and determined by the client. For our clients um, experiencing mental illness, the same banks, the same restaurants, the same uh, facilities that have to be by law accessible. Uh, if I uh, require equipment to get into the bank, are also required to be able to be accessible for people who have immense anxiety and they are not able to attend uh, and do their banking independently, or they are hearing voices or responding to voices. Our community needs to be accessible uh, to everyone. I'm going to pause there because I've just spoken for so many minutes, Catherine. Thanks, Terry. You know, every I was writing down a whole bunch of things as you were talking, and everything you talk about is all about thinking about hope and recovery. And, you know, I know that you've worked with people with significant trauma in their lives. And I just wanted to ask you in terms of the impact for you, you know, how do you always maintain that focus on hope, recovery and optimism in, in the face sometimes of some very tragic situations or difficult situations that you know that people have experienced? Yeah, so the, the first thing is, well, just to my experience, I guess now after 20 years, we, we, I just know things can get better, things can improve, and I've seen it time and time and time again. And uh, no matter how, how dire a situation seems, like there's lots of evidence-based uh, intervention, there's lots of support, there are excellent people who can help support people through recovery. And so going back to those experiences and looking at the success stories and not taking any credit for the success, but, but seeing how it, how it happens and reminding yourself uh, that, that great things can happen uh, despite seemingly uh, being in a very dark place uh, at one time or another. Um, I, I think your question was about trauma. Well, I'm just thinking for you, does it weigh heavy on you sometimes? And you know, how do you cope and, you know, maintain hope? Yeah, so I, I'm looking at the faces and I see all the people on this call that, that deal with uh, that, that deal with that as well. And I'll speak uh, only for myself. And that is, uh, uh, I pay attention to self-care, that's for sure. Um, and one of the things that we do from a self-care perspective is, is always focusing on the agency of the, the person we're serving understanding that we're there to serve. We're not there to fix. The person's not a problem to be solved uh, or something that needs to be fixed uh, because it's, it's so much more complex than that. And if I'm going about my, my work as a clinician with the intention of fixing something, that's gonna have a poor outcome for, for everybody, including me. Um, when the people we're serving have, have successes, um, we, we don't take the credit for it. It's, so, you know, job well done, Catherine. As an OT, you did a really great job. It, our clients are, are uh, showing tremendous courage and just the ability to engage um, in these dark times. And so when you don't take responsibility for what's happening, but you're there to support and serve, then when things are not so bright and shiny, you're, you too are not taking responsibility for when things are, are a little bit uh, darker or not going the way that they ought to be going. Uh, and the other thing that we can do to, to cope with, with uh, what you're describing is to be agents of change and to be engaged in system change and ensuring that we keep our eye on the ball when it comes to how we're delivering services. Uh, and then you, those are the feel good, the feel good moments. Um, I, I was really struck when you, when you said that um, the the thing about holding on to hope for for others and and it it sort of resonated for me about uh, sometimes the idea of lending strength to others and and I think uh, sometimes in healthcare we get afraid of that line and and you you spoke a little bit about the um, sort of non almost non attachment to outcome in terms of um, not being overly invested one way or the other, but still caring. And so I think sometimes I see people in healthcare sort of really step back from that line to, to avoid crossing it inappropriately or um, in a way that's too heavy for them. Can I ask you what you feel like we lose if we step too far back from that line and lose our capacity to hold hope for others? 
Yeah, sure. And it, it happens, I, I think, not infrequently. Um, I think uh, as clinicians, we get, like, it could be a long haul, especially during this pandemic. But when you're, when you're working with somebody who is struggling and you don't feel like you're making progress, um, that, can be, that can be pretty heavy. And it, after doing this for months and years, if you allow yourself to um, start to give up or give in and forget that you're working with a human being with a story, not a, somebody that needs to be fixed, um, you can start to fall back into that and you can start to lose, lose your compass around what's um, neglectful and what's overprotecting. So you can kind of, you'll start to fall into one of those two camps just by, by virtue of forgetting about the hope. Uh, we, can, we, we tend to become, if we're um, at times very overprotective and okay, it, it, this just needs to be so, sorted out. You just need to take your meds. You just need to stop using. You just need to stop the behavior. Okay, those are the things that have to happen and all will be well. It's very, it's very uh, paternalistic and it's, it's, it's overprotective and it's not supporting someone from a recovery perspective. It's telling somebody what to do or what they have to do in order to be a human being and that doesn't work. And then on the other side, we can become neglectful. We can lose all hope. We can lose all hope and we can start to use language that I'll probably talk a little bit about later um, that reflects that, you know, what are we gonna do with it? There's nothing we can do. This is the person's choice. And uh, if they choose that, then we're just gonna let this happen. And uh, if they if they choose to live on the streets and if they choose this life, then that's, that's, where, that's where the ball lands. And so, so when we lose hope, uh, these are the kinds of things that happen. It's up to us as, as healthcare leaders to, to really keep that in check. I see that kind of stuff happening around here uh, every day. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Shane. And I'm just looking at Nandini has her hand up. And I just, um, and again, if people have some comments too in the chat, feel free to, to pop them in there. Nandini, did you want to comment? Um. Rather than a comment, I would like to uh, have some insight from Terry about his experiences. Uh, when he, when Terry, when you're talking about holding hope and uh, uh, working with our clients or patients and treating them as human beings while holding their hopes. Now, what are the challenges for uh, for? you or what are the challenges that you experienced while working in this field while working with diverse populations so for example now our uh, school is very much on edii so say working with indigenous population or working with culturally different or religiously different so what what could be the challenges well i i think the very first challenge is like staring right into the camera right now, I would say um, I, I'm providing services in the context that you just described, and I'm a I'm a Canadian-born white man, um, and I'm coming at this from a complete place of privilege in everything I do, um, and so that that is a challenge uh, that, that I need to acknowledge and always be acknowledging and, and considering. Um, there are many challenges. I know we only have a, an hour, a half hour left, um, but that would be that would be the primary place is recognizing that we are coming. Mo most of us here are coming from a, a place of privilege, and I'll speak for myself uh, only. Um, and so we need to recognize that as we're holding on to the, the hope for people. And in mental health, uh, there is always this gap that you need to mind around the power differential between the people you're serving being able to serve with compassion and respect, but still recognizing that you're, uh, you're in a position of power. I mean, for goodness sakes, we have the ability to place somebody on a, a form one and place them in a hospital against their will. Uh, some of the other challenges are systemic challenges, our, our system working together um, in, a, in a coordinated manner um, and, and everyone agreeing what are the, what are the rules of the road how are we all? So how do how do I view this human being? What's my what's my plan? How are my interactions going? What about my community partners? How are they um, viewing this person? Through what lens? Is it through a medical lens, 
Is it through a lens of um, substance use? Is, is are our community partners falling into the non-negotiable treatments um, phase rather than a recovery? Or am I doing that? So these are the things that we're, we're mindful of all the time. Thanks for that, Terry. I'm just pulling from the chat too. I think, you know, looking at ourselves in the mirror is such a great answer um, in perspective, particularly challenging. And Diana Hopkins Raseel has a question about recovery. And I, I just, again, kind of the nuances of what you spoke about recovery. And, and she's asking, are most mental illnesses we, can sit, we encounter in practice in life more relapsing, remitting chronic conditions than lo those leading to full recovery. So just kind of around the nuances, because I understand what you mean by recovery and just kind of teasing out that, that concept a bit more. So the question, Diana, is are most mental illnesses relax, relapsing, remitting or? Yeah. Is Diana, I, oh, there's Diana. Just, I think around the nuances of the word, sorry, Diana, it's your your. Yeah, that, that's it, Terry. I mean, um, I believe that when I, as a physiotherapist, encounter mental conditions or mental issues with uh, patients or even my colleagues and peers, much of it seems to be relapsing, remitting. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm a recovered alcoholic, but I'm fighting it every day the rest of my life or you know I um I have a relative who has schizophrenia and you know this is a constant ongoing battle and which has you know exacerbations or crises and so on and um so both you know the compassion it seems to me and the caring maybe needs to recognize that um the boundaries are different every day for those folks yeah, and I'd, I'd say what you're describing in, in my own mind, uh, Diana, is is that recovery um, and mental illness in general are, are they're, it, they're very deeply, deeply personal experiences and unique experiences. And we do try to kind of put a, a line around it or a, a highlight to label things and to decide what's, what we're seeing. But really, I, I think it's, it's everyone's experience is, is unique and very deeply personal. Um, and so looking at it through that lens, we're, we're, we'd be less concerned about if something is, you know, going to repeat itself. Um, people will continue to have experiences, uh, with mental illness and, and understanding that it is part of that human being's experience and what, what is our role to play in that. And I'm, I'm going to pop in from like a, you know, physical rehab, you know, we often think recovery is things are going to, you know, there's going to be a resolution. And, you know, that's why the recovery term in mental health takes a little bit of time if people aren't familiar with it to, to really grapple with, with that, that different lens. Is there any other comments or, or reflections? I know there's a number of people I recognize that on the, on the call who might, you know, have some reflections to add or, or Terry, I don't know if you, I know we, we, you've got lots of other further um, things to, to share as well. Yeah, well, we had chatted, Catherine, about, about stigma and we had chatted a little bit about the language we use and, and uh, to the point about losing hope, I, I think uh, we still need a, we can talk a little bit more about the human being, looking at the person as a human being. Um, and that everyone has a story and constantly reminding ourselves of, of that because at times, it, you know, we do feel very overwhelmed. Uh, you can feel like you're not making any progress as like a clinician or a, or a healthcare leader and you can lose the hope. And then and we fall into those, um, uh, those rough times where we're becoming really official and trying to solve the problem or we just say, okay, well, what's, what's the use? And something that we talked about around stigma brings to mind the language that we use. And so maybe I'll just give an example of, of how we can use language and I'll give a real example and I'll, I'll cloud up enough details and I'm not breaching any confidentiality. But the way we, the way we communicate with one another as stakeholders uh, in mental health and in healthcare and services really guides, it really 
it's the language is telling telling everyone around us what we're thinking, how we're characterizing this person or this situation. And we know that communication is so important. But when we start to lose hope, our communication can change. And then that actually is a, a pretty uh, vicious circle. So let's say I see uh, Amy Chesney's on the line here and, and uh, she's a manager of one of our ACT teams. And we've had some, some fun experiences with, with taking on new clients. And let me give you an example of if I come to a, a team in, in, uh, in Morning Report and I have a new client to present and I can choose to present the, present the profile and I'm not gonna give you a whole case review, but in general, I could say something to the effect of, okay, we have a new, a new client guys, it's a 21 year old woman, she's a prostitute uh, who uses crystal meth and she has a diagnosis of a personality disorder. Um, she has a boyfriend uh, that uh, is around quite a bit. She's fairly avoidant, so we may have our hands full trying to track her down. She's not really willing to engage, but you know we'll do our best. She does have housing. It's precarious. She's often uh, often not there, according to the housing worker. She she's uh, often goes for days at a time, and she's not not around. So it's really difficult to engage, and and uh, it acts kind of strange. Um, very drug seeking. Or the uh, description could be a little bit different and it could be more accurate and it could paint a different picture. So the description could be, okay, uh, guys, we have a new, uh, a new client referred to us and uh, she's a young woman, she's 21. She identifies as indigenous. She doesn't live on territory, but she does live here in Kingston. She has housing, but it's a little bit uh, unstable. So we'll have to pay attention to that. Um, she has uh, some cognitive impairment due to her fetal alcohol syndrome um, uh, that largely gets unrecognized. And she's been diagnosed with schizophrenia at age 19. Uh, right now, her schizophrenia is untreated, but um, you know, we're hoping to, hoping to work to kind of get our, our hands around that a little bit. Uh, it's important to note that she has uh, a man uh, who identifies himself as her boyfriend. Um, now he's actually a uh, human trafficking uh, known to the police. And this is the situation where we find uh, our new client, she's being trafficked. So she often does disappear for days at a time. Um, she started, uh, she was involved with Children's Aid since around 12 years of age. Her mom uh, actually started her using crystal meth in an effort to engage her in her own um, human trafficking uh, scam in, in Peterborough. So the, the, the different ways that we communicate um, tell a different story. On the one hand, in the first way we, I described, um, it is very easy for um, providers to picture a prostitute who's addicted to drugs and difficult to get along with. Um, and we may say, well, what's the use? So you just gotta stop using or uh, there's nothing we can do if they don't wanna change their behavior, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the other hand, um, we do know that we're really good at supporting people who have schizophrenia. We're really good at supporting people who have cognitive impairment and have experience with fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, we can work with the police uh, around human trafficking and, and have been. So the way we communicate um, is, is pretty, pretty significant. Well, and, and Terry, I'm just picking up on, on how you communicate, too, in terms of you talked about challenges around power and system level challenges and, you know, how you communicate among sectors. So, you know, that example that you've just shared in terms of communication, you know, you're working in the community and then you interface with more traditional healthcare services who might use different languages. You know, how does language and and really, I'm going to say stigma that's embedded in the healthcare system, you know, how have you coped with that? And, you know, what what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, how to move forward? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, first of all, I think we have to keep our eye on the ball. And uh, somebody said it earlier, I think it was Andini, uh, we can we can start to lose hope and we our judgment becomes clouded in how we're looking at a person. We're looking at a person uh, and we're not actually seeing a human being. Um, if, you're, if you've ever had the opportunity to work at the integrated care hub, where some of us uh, frequent, there are people who, are, who um, present 
almost as I described earlier down on this end of the spectrum. Honestly, if you if you went on Facebook for some of those people, and as my daughters tell me, you can creep people on Facebook. If you went on Facebook, you'd find Facebook pages of, of people two years ago who were at Holy Cross or at Rigi, and their pictures do not um, identify as you were identifying the person before you. Um, and so, so really, we no matter where on, on that kind of that line someone is, always fo focusing back on the human being and then their story and where did they come from and how did how on earth did somebody end up here? I've often thought um, while working at, like on the inpatient units uh, in mental health, wondering uh, what would, what on earth would happen to this this woman if she had no one to advocate for? If there's no system in place, like if she would just if we just discharged and she was on the street, and and sadly what it comes down to is is that example of so if i communicated the way i communicated those two scenarios for the same person the first scenario that person is going to fall through the cracks because we're going to give up we're going to lose all hope um, and we're going to allow stigma to say oh, this is the person's life what we see before before us and as i see deji or india i've heard him say many times you know how dare we have the the uh the omnipotence to make someone's decision for them like that. Um, and sadly, it, it often is influenced by not having the privilege or the support. Um, it could get, come down to the color of someone's skin or their gender. Um, all of these things play a, play a part in how we view the person and what kind of decisions we're making. Mm -hmm. I'm just picking up a, a number of comments here in the chat, and I'm just going to pull up one. It says, how did it approach towards a dis discussion about mental health for persons with chronic pain? You can clearly assess our experiencing mood changes related to their chronic pain, but don't acknowledge it or don't want to acknowledge that they might have some coexisting or secondary mental health issues. So when maybe things are phrased in a physical, but there might be some underlying mental health issues and, and how, how, what were your thoughts on that? I just want to make sure I understand the, the scenario. It's if somebody is being treated for chronic pain. Yeah, I'm just gonna actually, if someone wants to unmute it and, and uh, elaborate further, um, Damon Jeet Ball. And I'm happy to, to uh, say it again, too, if, if I didn't say it clearly. Um, so how do you approach towards a discussion about mental health for people with chronic pain? So, you know, that you might see they're experiencing mood changes related to the, their pain, um, but for, they might not specifically acknowledge that it might actually be a mental health issue. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't presume to tell anyone how to practice uh, at all, but I would say um, if I was working with somebody with chronic pain, that I would also be paying attention certainly to their to their mental health. We you know chronic pain and, and decreased mood go hand in hand. And so I think being open about it and, and uh, asking. And I have a comment in the chat. If you hurt, you hurt. All pain is real. And, you know, I think that's a, a nice reflection, physical or mental health. Damon, you had a, a comment in the chat as well. I'm going to um, pick on you to unmute if you don't mind. Hi, sorry. I was not able to unmute at that time. Uh, oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> sorry. Thank that's you okay. for answering my question, Terry. So, uh, what happens commonly, especially with chronic pain, is you know you can uh, you've been working with the patient and you can see uh, during the span of the treatment, especially with follow-ups, that they are experiencing mental health issues, which might have been present even from before, or you see them secondarily develop during the course of their chronic pain. And I can understand. Probably a lot of physicians see it. You must have seen chronic pain being the most common cause 
uh, of uh, mental health issues in, you know, in common practice. So sometimes you want to or wish to start a conversation with them and you probably, you know, drop hints um, in a non-judgmental manner. But uh, a lot of times, especially in certain communities, they are not very open to, you know, hold a discussion on that issue. So if somebody is missing... Um, basic I want to say insight how do you think um, you know one can approach towards helping them realize because um, you know uh, sometimes you can clearly see that if they realize this I think their pain can also be handled well too so that was my question yeah well that's a difficult a difficult uh, to answer because I am trying to picture this this client, but I would say where we always start um, is with continuing to build some kind of therapeutic rapport and, and sticking to that no matter how long uh, we're spending time with someone so that we can open up those conversations. It's also difficult for me to answer because that, after many years, I'm really comfy with asking people about their mood and about how they're feeling. Um, and uh, I, I know lots of people are, are comfortable with that, but I, it's interesting that we would we hesitate uh, to to ask somebody about how they're how they're feeling um, when it's human experience. We're all on that we're all on that line that I described earlier. Um, I often I used to think uh, that um, people were were sensitive to, to bring this up or to talk about it, and that it, you know stigma kind of played a big role in. People wondered what I did for a living, for example, and they were sensitive, uh, sensitive around me. Perhaps I don't know. What I found quickly after moving to Kingston and working in mental health, and then starting to coach, for example, is that as I got to know people, I started getting more and more phone calls um, from people that I knew outside of mental health in hockey dressing rooms and at soccer fields, parents, people I played sports with myself, and the calls went up in frequency, and they continue today people feeling very comfortable and vulnerable enough uh, to call and, and share that they're going through a difficult time or their child is or their loved one is, and they don't understand it. They don't know it. That they can't put their, they can't describe it, nor should they have to. It's not up to somebody to have to articulate. I believe I've been watching my son and I think he has a DSM-5 uh, diagnosis of this. Uh, but as you know, we can be prepared to hear. So people are, people are open to, to this, discussing but always from a from a client-centered perspective of course right so uh taking into account cultural um uh considerations uh and and everything that goes along with that as as you mentioned i think some of the challenges of of feeling that you don't want to bring up issues around mental illness even though that by not talking about it, it can actually make it more challenging for people. Yeah, the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Damon, did you have a comment? I know from an ER perspective and... Um, sure. So uh, Terry, thank, thanks a bunch uh, for coming out tonight and, and having this conversation with us. Um, I, I probably have about 10 different things that I could sort of pick up on and, and definitely you're you know, talking about the continuum or the bandwidth um, when you talk about one end of the continuum. I, I don't see all my patients at the other end of the continuum, but, but I definitely almost every shift see at least one, sometimes multiple, who are at the very end of the continuum at, at the extreme in crisis where um, safety and survival can be um, actually the, the primary goal, um, cause so bad things do, do happen. So, um, you know, and, and I, we talked to mentioned about stigma and, and definitely, you know, the emergency, uh, nurses, physicians, social workers, and, and everybody really try very hard despite somebody in a crystal meth psychosis crisis, um, to see them as human, to, to realize that there's a story there. So I'm really glad that you continue to sort of reinforce that, it, you know, who is that person in there who's in crisis. But one positive I, I just mentioned in the chat that I wanted to mention is um, <clears throat> more recently, maybe just within the last year or so, um, 
having a mental health worker work with the police and respond to crises in the community and, and de-escalate and sort of reduce harm along with the police and really partner. And then as they come into the hospital to the emergency department has really created, um, for want of a better word, an improved dynamic all the way around, um, a better sense of the person, um, better de-escalation, better safety, uh, and, and better communication with the healthcare staff trying to care for the person. So just wondering maybe if you could comment on, on whether we have the possibility, resources, capacity to do more of that. Because I have noticed a palpable um, improvement, uh, at least in the, the environment I work in, uh, from adding that in. Yes, yes, that's the answer. Uh, Damon, we do have the, we do have the resources and uh, happy to explore, explore further. What's, what you're describing to me sounds like is, it's just more collaboration and a more, more client-centered approach. And coming into Emerge, obviously people are coming in urgently and coming to get um, often their life saved. Um, <clears throat> but when somebody is living with a, an enduring mental illness, it's also an opportunity for us to work together and communicate together better. And even if, to just change some of the narrative uh, that would hopefully change the trajectory of what could happen, which we know how mm -hmm. it can go. Sometimes people come in to emerge, they get treated, stabilized and right back uh, in. There's all kinds of complexities around that. There's the mental mm -hmm. health law, there's, uh, there's all kinds of things to consider. Uh, but if we can start moving the yardstick around the language that we use and the, and the um, expectations, like where are we setting the bar? Uh, for for this person to work more closely uh, across sectors, only good things can happen, and we can make changes like that. I, like I got an email today from a family doctor. I printed it off in case I could use it as an example. We're running a pilot project where we're we're making some changes as to how we um, referrals from family doctors, and so. In a nutshell, this family doctor just sent a, an email to one of our team managers today, saying basically. Uh, this mirrors my, my experience has been excellent. These, these complex patients, they do weigh me down uh, as I recognize their suffering, which is uh, which uh, as one physician, I can only make a small impact on. However, I leave your shared mental health rounds feeling excited and uplifted about being able to connect my patients to you all. Uh, and so looking at how we can do things differently and, and be those agents of change rather than status quo, because as Dr. Ayurindi would say its status quo is not, not acceptable. Great, thanks, Terry. Did you have a question? Yes, um, th thanks, Terry, and um, great presentation, great title as well, and um, the fact that not all, you know, not all sizes fit. Um, um, and that we all deviate from 100% mental wellness by a factor of X. So no one is 100% and certainly no one can sustain 100% mental health. I I'm just wondering, and having worked with you and seen you day in, day out with compassion and empathy, and these are things that are really difficult to teach, you know, um, how do you make this infectious? How, how can you make all of us those here and others, how do we grow in those things? Thank you. That's a good question. I think you do a pretty good job, Deji, uh, just by leading by example. Um, I think we do, I think we're doing a fairly good job uh, in community mental health with, with making that infectious. I think we, we do it by always reminding ourselves uh, what what the task at hand is, and that's and that's serving a client who's vulnerable, uh, and serving a group of clients and, and human beings, and constantly reminding ourselves that we're not trying to solve problems or fix fix things. And I'm not, you know, I'm not punching a time card. None of us are punching a time card and just putting our, our hours in and then heading home and looking for some kind of outcome, some kind of positive outcome for the day that. Where, what we're looking for is, is to, be, to, be, to build that rapport and to be with someone through this kind of journey of recovery. And hopefully, you know, you look back after 
working with somebody for six months or a year and say, oh, things are much better. Things are much better. I walked by our conference room the other day and we had a, a, one of our social workers was sitting in there doing a job search with somebody who was very um, well put together and very clean cut and uh, sober and, uh, and said hi to me and called me by my name. And uh, that fellow, we had to follow around uh, the social worker. And I think you probably did a bit too. Followed this fellow around on the street as he was looking for cigarette butts and picking up, looking for marijuana to smoke. And uh, that's how all days were spent. And there was all kinds of questions about his own personal safety and, and how vulnerable he was. And I walked by this conference room today and he's looking for a job and he's chatting away and he's got his hair cut. And that was last summer that we, uh, we engaged with this fellow. So I think that's how we keep, keep our eye on the ball. There's just, just like success story after success story after success story. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not all people in, in crisis. As Damon describes, it's, 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 there's 10 people in an emergency uh, department, only one is presenting. I'm also reminded, you know, on our sort of community treatment teams in Kingston, we have approximately 400 clients who we who we um, serve in Kingston. We see uh, most days, and so for every one person that arrives uh, for emer at emerge in crisis, there are another 400 people that are not and that are living lives. And at one point. Uh, the trajectory of their life was in a very different uh, position. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Deji. Thanks, Terry. And you know, I I know I can say this from you know seeing so many different occupational therapy students learn from you, Terry, over the years. That truly, you've maintained this this ability to for everyone to see the common humanity in, in everyone. And I, I really noticed that that's what the students take with them. This, this, this compassion, not to necessarily patients, but to, to everyone that they interact with. And you can see the shift as they come back from that experience, truly. Um, I'm just looking at the time and I know we could actually be here for a long time talking. And I, I noticed there's one other comment in the chat I just wanted to get to. Um, Rosecca, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, Terry, can you comment on the importance of continuative, continuity of care and the importance of keeping the door open in the existing healthcare system, which is an enormous comment as we wrap up today. <laughs> but we'd love your insights. <laughs> um, thanks, Rosecca. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, Dr. Jokic knows this well, that continuity of care is so critical. And so we can't be, we can't, we have four minutes, I'll describe. We can't be designing a system uh, just uh, to serve us as professionals. It has to be uh, to, to support the needs of an individual or somebody who requires um, services and uh, deserves our, our, our services. Um, so that's how we, that's, that's one of the, the tenets of recovery. We, we, we design services and processes around the client's needs and continuity of care is, is critical. Um, and so the way I picture it, uh, Dr. Jokic in my head is, is why it's so important is that we ought to be able to have a system where people can kind of float into our lives or we can float into their lives, but that we don't need to be in their lives forever. We don't need to have this dependence where you're going to come and see me for the rest of your life and you need this. You need me in your life in order to, you should be able to move on and, and, and enjoy the life that you you choose. But then when uh, things go downhill, you should be able to float back into my life pretty quickly. And I shouldn't be creating systems where I say, no, you've been discharged, or no, you don't have a diagnosis anymore, or oh, there was a mix up on the paperwork. Um, the, the system ought to be uh, flexible and, and accessible so that people aren't stuck to it, uh, but it can live their life and they can go to a different level of service and still come back to this level of service. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of system changes that, we, that we're constantly working on. It's like our uh, disability support uh, scheme mm -hmm. in Ontario, OD ODSP. It's set up in such a way that there's no incentive to stop. There's little incentive to go get a job. I mean, if you go get a job and you don't get your medication paid for. If you don't get your medication paid for, you become really unwell and, and so on and so forth. So 
So yeah, thanks, uh, Rizika. I think the continuity of care and us being flexible, and I know you guys at Mood Disorder Clinic are, you invented the fast track return. Yes, and, and thank you for sharing that passion with me, uh, uh, Terry. We had these discussions before, but I really wanted you to round up with this because I feel it's so important. You got it. And I'm going to say that is the dream we're all aiming for. And, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up, Terry, with something that you always I've I've had many sayings that I've written down over the years that you've you've helped me think differently about life, you know, and, you know, this idea of this this common humanity, which I feel like really is is sort of the underlying theme of what you're talking about. And you always say meeting people where they're at. And, you know, I really love that. You know, I, I think that's such a, a nice way to think about even from a service provision and just from, you know, how we interact with with everyone around us all the time. So, Tara, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Healthcare and Humanity series and uh, for taking the time out of your schedule, which I know is, is Zoom full and uh, having the conversation with us here today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And and for everybody who took time out of their day to join us and uh May you have a good rest of the day and, and hopefully we'll see you in, in June for our next, our next talk. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Derek.